My name is Nicole Garcia. When I was five years old, I witnessed my father stab my mother to death. When I was five, my parents separated and they started a um, divorce proceeding. My mother was in the Army Reserves and she moved in with a friend from the Army Reserves, I believe was also going through a divorce. They got a house together and my mother and her friend Debbie went back to my father's house to try to gather the belongings. My mother did get a restraining order against my father. And when they went back to get some of the belongings, they got into like a little fight or whatever and police were called. And my father claims that my mother and Debbie stole his guns, which is understandable giving the threats he was giving if they did. I, I don't know whether they did or not, but it sounds logical to me. And so once they uh, got their own house, um, she also had a daughter about around my age. I remember me and my siblings had her own room and then my mother had a room and then I believe Debbie and her daughter had a room together. My father threatened both of them frequently, would leave notes on the door. He pinned notes to the door, threatening their lives. He burned up their lawn furniture, and my mother had to go the next day and talk to the neighbor because the neighbor was like, what was going on? There's like this big fire. My mother had to go explain the situation that was going on. Well, also, my father would slash the car tires so that they wouldn't be able to go anywhere. Two or three days before the double homicide occurred, there was a neighborhood watch meeting, and my mother and Debbie showed my father's picture to everyone in the neighborhood watch meeting and said, if you see this man, please call the police. He's going to kill us. Debbie was so scared for her life that she was starting to look for a new place to live. Debbie, I believe, wanted to help my mother and didn't realize it was this bad. One of the women in the neighborhood, they went to her and asked if she would please stay at the house because they were so afraid. And she had a gut feeling to not stay at the house. And she instead said, I'll give you some floodlights so if he comes by, the lights come on and her gut instinct was correct because they were both murdered that night. On August 24th, 1985, in the early hours of the day, I think around 2 a.m. or something, my father was found in a tree outside the house holding a knife. Neighbors thought this was suspicious, somehow not realizing it was the same person, but they called the police. He got arrested for prowling, violating the restraining order, and a bunch of other charges. And he got out. So he got out on a $3,000 bail bond around 6 a.m. The bail bondsman said, hey, I can drive you to your home. He said, no, no, I got to go pick up my motorcycle. The bail bondsman drove him to go pick up his motorcycle, which was um, about a block away from my mother's home, hidden under some ivy, tried to hide it. And the bail bondsman said as he was driving up to go take him to get his motorcycle, the car was still running and he opened the door, jumped out and started running. He ran into my mother's home. He broke in the back door. And since the police had confiscated his knife when he was initially arrested, he went in to my mother's room. And that particular night I was sleeping with my mother because I had a nightmare. He, despite seeing me there, still killed her. I woke up to hearing the piercing screams of my mother, and I just started screaming with her. He stabbed her, and then he went into Debbie's room and uh, stabbed her. Debbie, at the time, was trying to call for help on a CB radio, but the person on the other end of the line didn't understand what she was saying because she was dying as she was making the call. I believe that after that happened, I fell asleep from the shock because I remember waking up and there was just all around me on the bed. So I got up, um, I had a brother, he was about 15 months and my sister was three. And um, my sister got up and I just said, we gotta move. I remember my baby brother was crying because he wanted a bottle. So I went into the kitchen and made him a bottle. And then a few hours after they both were murdered, Debbie's cousin was knocking on the door. So I go to the door, I answer the door, he says, hey, just tell Debbie that I'm returning her car I borrowed. And I said, she's dead. And he thought I just was a five-year-old with an active imagination. I was saying that because they were sleeping in because it was a Saturday morning. I grabbed his arm. I said, no, Debbie is dead. And I, I pulled him really hard to bring him into the house. I remember he ran into the house and he said, oh my God, it's Paul. And 
outside the house was the cousin's parents because they were waiting for him to drive him home since he was borrowing a car. And he just told me and my siblings to stay put in the living room, don't move. And he went out there to tell his parents what was going on and then called the police. And then the police came and they interviewed me and my sister at the police station, but I don't really remember. And then they went to find my father who was already at work at that time. They found a pack of his he had dropped, and in one of the neighbor's yards, they found a checkbook of his. When the police did come to his home, he was doing a load of bloody laundry. So they had um, enough, due to the, like, the restraining order and the actual threats and everything and their fear that they had of him, they had enough cause to arrest him. So he got arrested. A year later, there was a trial, and um, I had to testify against him. I remember sitting on the stand. My grandmother, my mother's mother, had taken custody of us. My grandmother told the lawyers that I did not want to look at my father. It was nothing that I ever said, but it was what my grandmother said. So when I testified, they locked the chair so I couldn't move it. To um, So I'd only be facing the jury, not seeing my father. And I remember after uh, I testified, I was carried out of the courtroom and I saw my father's face and looked directly at him and he mouthed to me, I love you. Oh, I guess one other detail I missed was when my father was arrested for prowling, my mother and Debbie thought they could sleep okay that night, they'd be safe, that they had nothing to worry about anymore, but it wasn't the case. Oh, I also should add, like a week or two before this happened, my mother took me to a school Um, because I was supposed to be starting kindergarten. And I remember visiting um, this school and had like Sesame Street characters all along the, inside the classroom. That's all I really remember. And well, I never ended up going to that school because my grandparents uh, got custody of me. So what happened was the night of the murders, one of the police officers took us in. I guess there was no emergency foster homes available. So the police officer took us in. I remember, I think she had teenage kids and They were listening to rap music or something, and I'd never heard rap music before, as I guess my parents didn't listen to rap. I thought God was talking to me. My parents never talked to me about God, but this police officer did for some reason. So this police officer told me about God, and then I heard like this rap music, and I thought it was God talking to me, and I got scared and ran out of my room, and I said, God's talking to me, God's talking to me. And she goes, oh, no, no, it's my kids. I'll go tell them to turn down their music. So then the next day, the police officers asked if there was anyone in our family that could take us in. And I enthusiastically said, my grandma. And so they took me to my grandmother's work, which I remember it was like a building with a bunch of tables, like a bunch of office desks or something. I don't know if she was forewarned before we came or if she found out when we came. I am uncertain of that. Um, But I remember running up to her desk at her work. So that leads me to believe she didn't know or maybe she would have been home instead of at work. So then my grandmother, I think, didn't know how to deal with a child who had trauma because every little thing I did was wrong. At my mother's funeral, I did not cry, which I have now learned as an adult that that's pretty typical for children not to cry when they lose a parent so young because they're in a lot of shock and don't really understand what's going on yet. And so my grandmother would always berate me for not crying at my mother's funeral. My grandmother was pretty mentally abusive. Whenever I do anything wrong, she'd say, you're just like your father. Why can't you be more like your mother? Your mother was perfect. She had the perfect handwriting. She kept her room clean. Like anything that was a negative aspect of my personality My grandmother would say, you're just like your father. My grandmother wouldn't take us to therapy. We were court ordered to go to therapy, me and my uh, three-year-old sister. She took me probably two or three times. That's all I remember. I remember her taking me and uh, she pulled me out because she said all I did was play. You're supposed to go to therapy to talk, not play, because I would go in there and play with toys. So she pulled me out of this therapist, put me into another therapist, 
And I remember going to this therapist and I would see all the toys and I would just like be looking at the toys, knowing that my grandmother said, I can't play. I'm not allowed to play in therapy. So I would stare at the toys and finally the therapist said, you want to play something? And I said, yes. And so then I went to play and my grandmother pulled me out of therapy. I never went to therapy again. My grandmother, I guess, didn't understand that that's how children do therapy. And then I would have other issues. Um, I would wet the bed and my grandmother would punish me by sending me in a diaper to school. I skipped school by myself because none of the, my friends wanted to skip with me because they'd been in trouble too many times for skipping and I had never skipped and I decided I wanted to skip. So I, I was walking down the street and a guy pulled over and offered me a ride. And I just said, sure, and hopped in. And then he um, assaulted me, like not full rape. And then he also gave me $20, like I didn't comprehend. I think he thought I was a p dude, I don't know. I was confused because I was only 14 years old. With that $20, I purchased makeup with that $20. So when I came home with this makeup, my grandmother thought I had shoplifted. And I said, no, I bought it and I showed her the receipt. And then she's like, where did you get $20? And so then I just told her, oh, just some guy gave it to me. And then my grandmother was a very devout Catholic. And so she accused me of doing drugs, having sex and uh, all kinds of things. And so then she said, I'm taking you to the doctor. We're going to test you for AIDS, STDs, everything. And so then I went to the doctor and of course I was negative for everything. And she asked the doctor, to do a pelvic exam to see if I was still a virgin. And because I was 14, I was allowed to be in the doctor's office by myself. So my doctor told my grandmother, you, um, I need to talk to her by herself. My grandmother kind of resisted, but the doctor said, she's of age, I can talk to her by herself. So my grandmother left the room and my uh, pediatrician asked me if I was having sex and I said no. And she did not do an exam on me. She just told my grandmother, her hymen's sealed, she's fine. She's a, still a virgin. So I went to go stay with a cousin who, um, she's like six years older than me and already lived on her own. So I went to go stay with her for the night. And then the next day, CPS came and took me and my sister and put us into an emergency foster home. I was 14 when I went to the foster home. Well, I bounced from home to home because I didn't do well in the foster system. I didn't want to be there. I really wanted a family, like a normal family that where stuff like this doesn't happen. And I'd ask my social worker, put me in a home, put me in a foster home. I don't want to be in this in this like group home. And she told me people don't take in teenagers. Nobody wants a teenager. They want little kids. And then she also told me that if I just did good in this program, she'd find me a home. So I was like the star foster child, never got in trouble, did everything right, but they didn't put me in a foster home. So I decided if being good isn't going to get me what I want, then I'll be bad. So then I started running away all the time. And so they would move me homes but they couldn't keep me anywhere. So no matter where they put me, I would just run away. So they just kept putting me in higher, higher security homes so I couldn't leave. The last home was out, like, out in the middle of nowhere, so it was like impossible to run away from. And then when I was 17, my mother's cousin took me in. Apparently no one in the family knew I was in foster care. My grandmother told nobody. I moved in, it was like my last year of high school and it wasn't like the full year. I came in the middle of the school year. And I think I came in like October. So it was like to the schools, the school, because um, they lived in like a more upscale neighborhood. And because of that, they didn't want a former foster kid in their school. So they denied me um, entry into the school. Their excuse in the beginning was because I was behind. But the only reason I was behind was because I had jumped so many different schools and every school had a different requirement to graduate. But I was like way ahead. I graduated with more credits than I needed. So they denied me until I caught up. So I did homeschooling to catch up and I caught up so I could start going there in January and they denied me entry. So I instead just went to a continuation high school and graduated from there. Well, I had a rough start. My mother's cousin, he has three sons and I can't remember, like, I really don't remember the incident, but I got in an argument with them and I packed up and left. I had already graduated high school. So I just upped and left and uh, moved in with a boyfriend. He didn't know I was moving in with him, but he found out when I showed up. I went there and he, he still lived with his parents and he had uh, eight siblings. And then he was the oldest, he was my age. 
and and they were of a different culture. So I had to learn a whole new culture. And in their culture, you don't live with someone unless you're married. So they told all their family that we were married. They were planning to like do a, a wedding ceremony of some sort, and but it, it never happened because that relationship didn't last. Um, he was a jailbird. He was in and out of jail, and I just finally got tired of it. I've always been able to tell my story. That I never had like a problem with, but mentally I never was that strong. Um, I mean, I had my own suicide attempts. I struggled with being homeless. Really, the like epiphany to um, to everything didn't happen until my late 20s. It happened because I got involved with somebody who I believe to be a narcissist. He was involved with me and another woman, and I didn't know it. I thought I was the only person. And next thing you know, I hear an announcement that he's getting married. And I'm just like, wait, what? How could he be getting married? We like, we've been seeing each other for a long time. And that's, that kind of was my wake up call because he threatened me. I was scared, extremely scared of him. And he put a restraining order against me. That was like the, the strange thing. Like he was threatening me, but he put a, I think he knew that I was probably planning to do that to him. So he rushed to the courthouse to beat me. So I just filed one back against him. After that, I like realized I keep getting in these like really horrible relationships. I don't feel like I'm any different than my mother. These are the type of men I find. So I started learning about hypnosis, EFT. It changed me. I, I started to heal and get better. Well, me personally, I've never went to therapy. I seek more whole body stuff because I feel like therapy, all you're doing is reliving the past over and over again. And that's not really gonna heal you. Like I have post-traumatic stress disorder and I still jump when I hear a loud noise. No therapist in the world can make that stop because that's a nervous system issue, not a brain issue. And they don't work with the nervous system. That's where I think like other types of therapies that I haven't tried yet but want to like do like somatic healing. They more work with like the nervous system, regulating it, getting it back to the normal state. But so far, EFT and hypnosis have worked fine for me, even though I still jump at loud noises. I'm still to this day afraid of the dark because my, my father came in when it was dark. So I still have the fear of the dark. I, don't, I can't drive at night. I get paranoid and think people are following me. So I just stay home at night. I don't drive at night. Well, I don't get involved in bad relationships anymore. I'm very um, careful about choosing partners. I mean, all the, the males in my life that were supposed to protect me didn't. I can't think of anything, but I am launching a podcast like at the end of this month um, called Unlearn the Trauma, which is going to be about like healing from trauma. I'm going like, to discuss different things like hypnosis, EFT, somatic healing, EMDR, just normal stuff too, like having compassion for yourself, forgiveness for yourself.